Welcome to Travel World 95. I'm Stephen Pickford. Glad you could join us. On today's program, the growth in cruise passengers over the past decade has been exponential in nature. Cruise lines continue to develop and launch newer, larger ships than ever before. Veritable floating hotels. But to date, the Quebec market has lagged a little behind the rest of North America in accepting the cruise experience. We'll learn more later when Nusi Nolet of Royal Caribbean Cruise Line drops by, learn more about the cruise experience itself and the travel value that it represents. But first, what does the international traveler come to expect in the terms of both in-flight and on-the-ground services? I spoke recently with John Wood, Vice President and General Manager Canada for British Airways and U.S. Air during a brief stopover in Montreal, and I began by asking him why in this era when many other carriers are simply signing intracompany marketing alliances, why British Airways has taken the step of taking out an actual equity investment in companies such as U.S. Air and Qantas. Here's what he had to say. Well, our belief, Stephen, is that uh, by having an investment in a carrier, it does cement the relationship more strongly than just having a marketing agreement. We believe that that way we can actually plan for the future uh, more securely, knowing that the relationship between the companies is actually uh, reinforced by the investment that uh, we have made. Okay. Now, so far, how successful has British Airways and US Air been in North America uh, in cementing such a relationship? Uh, very successful. When you look at uh, in the USA, where most of the relationship between BA and US Air takes place actually in the market, uh, we have co-sharing relationships on over 50 routes uh, from the USA over British Airways gateways into the UK. And the traffic that we've earned um, in conjunction with US Air on those co-share routes has been uh, extremely good and much higher than we had uh, previously before the relationship started. Right, because that gives you sort of a domestic fee to, rather than just a few gateway cities, it opens up the whole of... North yes, it means that we can access using the British Airways code cities that we don't fly to directly in conjunction with our partnership with US Air. Right, and for US Air, then it works the opposite way because they didn't have too many international routes beforehand, it opens up a whole worldwide yeah, and structure. and it means that they can carry connecting passengers to our British Airways gateways in the USA, which they wouldn't have carried before because they'd have gone on different domestic carriers. Right, they would have gone with other, so other it's carriers. A, it's a win-win for both of us. Right, wins for both of them. Uh, also in Canada now, it's sort of more an integrated management structure, uh, sort of, you're using this more as a example that you want to go more, more into, or? Yes, well, what we did in Canada was, uh, a year ago, I was given the job of actually looking after both airlines, both British Airways and US Air in Canada, which was the first time in the alliance that British Airways has with a number of carriers that we've taken that step. And really, I've been uh, looking at ways of getting BA and US Air to work closely together in Canada to our mutual benefit. Uh, this is a model that we hope to uh, replicate in other parts of the world in the future. But really, this is the first time we've done it, and it's my job to make sure it works so we can learn from the experience and. Uh, applied elsewhere in other countries, either with USA or with other alliance partners. Right, so I'll use this as a test and then see how it might work with Qantas or TAT or what have you. Yes, yes. Okay, now standardization of service product on board. Again, when you start with a number of carriers, sometimes there may be differences, first of all, differences in corporate cultures, but differences in the way they've been operating. How has this been uh, looked at to, for, when somebody flies to US Air, they're, used to a product on BA and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one has to realize that we are talking about an alliance of different carriers. Now, we're not talking about one large global airline. We're talking about airlines cooperating together to form an alliance. So within the British Airways Alliance, we have Qantas, British Airways, US Air, TAT, the French airline, and Deutsche BA, the German-based airline. And all these airlines have products that are appropriate for their own local markets. What we're trying to do is make sure that when those products actually interlink with each other, and passengers are moving from one airline to the other, they get as seamless a transfer as possible, but also that the basic products are similarly designed for our prime segments, which are the business traveler and the leisure traveler. Okay, now what, in your research, what does the business traveler really want? Is it different in different parts of the world, or are there some underlying factors? I think there's certainly some underlying factors, but I think also, as you say, in different parts of the world, you've got different competitive situations, and therefore different products that are appropriate to different parts of the world where the the aviation industry is developing at a different pace. And um, what we, we're trying to do is to make sure that the basic requirements of the business traveler are provided by all our alliance partners, and that when the airlines actually uh, touch, when people connect between the two airlines, they get a seamless transfer between the two. And what do Canadians or North Americans in general tend to prioritize when it comes to business travel? Depends on the sort of journey they're doing, I think, Steve. When they're flying long haul, they certainly want a degree of comfort 
uh, so that when they, when they arrive at their destination, they can uh, go straight off to do their business, feeling refreshed and relaxed. And British Airways works very hard to make sure that the products that we offer the businessman do provide that for him. Obviously, he wants a scheduled flight, and he wants a flight that uh, uh, arrives on, on time and departs on time. We make sure we give him that. But as far as the, the, the company is concerned, um, in both our first class and our Club World business class product, we try and make sure he has a, a comfortable flight as possible so that he does arrive in good shape to do business. We believe that that's not just in the air, but also on the ground. So, for instance, uh, first class passengers who are leaving Montreal Mirabel Airport to go to London on our daily overnight service are able to take advantage of a, a meal on the ground before they depart at the Chateau Mirabel Hotel. Then we have a full sleeper service on board the aircraft where they get a, a, a doona to sleep under and a sleep suit and a very fast meal service if they still want to eat on the aircraft so they can maximise their sleeping time. When they get to London, we have the, uh, the arrivals lounge at Heathrow, which is where they can go and have a shower, get their suit pressed, change their shirt, have a, have a light breakfast, and go straight off to do business. And we find that uh, our businessmen uh, appreciate that because it means they can both the ride refreshed and also save on hotel accommodation because by arriving in good shape in the morning and by going to our arrivals lounge and getting freshened up, they can save on one night's hotel accommodation. And of course, value is something that businessmen value at the moment. Uh, right, it's better to give them extra value than to play around on fair because when you dilute, start diluting the yield you can never it's hard to get it, get it back yes. and of course you are one of the few remaining carriers with a first class cabin flying out of Montreal. Well, we're the only one flying to London with first class and uh, we're very pleased to be in that situation because there is still a good first class market uh, for British Airways and we're keen to uh, develop that and uh, as being the only carrier that is offering a full first class service it leaves us well placed to do that. Right. Now, somewhere to Europe, you also talked about leisure travelers. Sometimes leisure travelers think, oh, we don't want to go to Europe this year because our dollar won't go too far, but you've got some products in the market which is trying to, trying to alleviate that uh, with yes. British Airways holidays, yes. things like that. Yeah, we're finding that uh, British Airways being such a large airline and bringing in so many people to the UK enables us to buy hotels and car hire rates at rates that are very attractive to people coming in from countries like Canada. So even though the exchange rate might be working against us at the moment, you can mitigate that by taking advantage of the deals that we've got. So for instance, this summer, you can fly uh, to British, on British Airways to London and pick up packages that have hotels from as little as $55 a night, including a full breakfast, a car hire from as little as $24 a day, which is extremely good value, and also take advantage of packages that we have not just in the UK, but also across Europe, particularly in France, where again we've got hotels starting from $55 a night. And um, we're finding that our bookings for this summer have been very strong, but the Canadian market to Europe is still strong in British Airways, despite the exchange problems. And uh, I think by working with us, both in the air and on the ground, the customer can get a really good deal. Right, by putting the, those components together. And also when they arrive in London and want to go on to the rest of Europe, you work to lower some of their costs for Airfares in Europe, people always gain thought point to point was prohibitive, but you have the Europe Air Pass program. Well, we do. We have uh, competitive fares to Europe. This autumn, for instance, you'll be able to fly there for $668 return, and uh, equally competitive fares into uh, the rest of Europe as well as London. Uh, we've opened something called the Flight Connection Centre at Heathrow, which means that those passengers who do fly with us to London and then go on to the rest of Europe get the chance to uh, freshen up and, and, and relax in the Flight Connection Centre at Terminal 1 before going on to their, their European service, and that's proving extremely attractive to our customers. Uh, the Europe Air Pass is um, a new facility which is selling extremely well. It does mean that, you, that people can fly into London and then take advantage of a package of uh, tickets that uh, entitles them to fly on British Airways and their other partner airlines, TAT and Deutsche BA, between the European cities. And uh, the deal there is that each sector can cost as little as $107. Putting together a fare to London plus the European Air Pass, it's possible to put together a package that really is extremely attractive. Okay, now some people are staying closer to home, they're flying within North America. US Air is also starting under Open Skies to add some new routes and services out of Montreal. Yes, Open Skies is very exciting for US Air because it just gives us a chance to realign our schedules in line with US Air's strengths, which are the, uh, the flows of traffic north, south, up and down the eastern seaboard of the, the USA and Canada. And as part of that, we're going to be launching a new service on June the 19th, which will be a double daily service from Montreal to Washington National Airport, uh, which we believe is going to be extremely successful. It's going to be the only service between Montreal and Washington National that has first class on board. It's going to be operated by 
737 aircraft, full-size jets, and will be the only carrier doing that. Uh, the competition that we'll be facing on, on, on the route will be from uh, commuter jets, who obviously don't have quite the space on board that our jets will have, and also require that uh, you can't actually board from a pier, you have to go out onto the, uh, the tarmac to board, which obviously isn't so attractive in the winter uh, when it gets pretty cold or the, the summer when it gets pretty hot. So we believe that our full jet service will be something that business travellers in particular will appreciate. Uh, it'll be the first time that there's been non-stop service from Montreal to Washington National, which previously wasn't allowed to have non-stop services prior to the Open Skies Agreement. Well, thank you very much, John Wood, for joining us and letting us know more about both British Airways and US Air and your alliance, how it's working in Canada. Thank, thank you, Stephen. It's a pleasure. My name is Jennifer McMoore and I'm from Ulysses Travel Publication. In today's travel corner, I'll be continuing what I was discussing last week, describing the various different types of travel literature that are available on the market today. Uh, the first two guides I'll be talking about are two uh, old favorites of the American travel, um, sorry, published by American travel publishers. There's the Fromer's Guide and the Fodor's Guide. Um, many people wonder what is the difference between these two, these two guides and essentially there is not much uh, to discern the two apart from a budget consideration. Because the, the, generally the hotels and restaurants listed in the Fodor's Guide, the gold one here, uh, tend to be quite a bit more expensive than the Fromer's Guide. Uh, the Fodor's usually um, is a guide we recommend for people who don't really have any budget constraints, who just want to go and visit a country, uh, they want to stay in the best of hotels and eat in the finest of restaurants. Uh, whereas the Fromer's are, are more aimed at uh, travelers who who uh, still want to stay in nice hotels but don't want to pay through the nose for it. Uh, both these guides provide all sorts of practical information as well on how to get around within a particular city or country. They also give uh, information on the sites and um, the history and, and culture. Um, another difference between the two would be the presentation. Uh, I personally find the Fromers a little easy to consult. The page layout is much clearer and it's easier to flip through and, and uh, you know, find something without having to check the index necessarily. Uh, the Fromers, or sorry, the Fodors is a little bit more narrative in its presentation and uh, some people find it more interesting to read ahead of time to get an idea of, of uh, the, where they'll be heading. Uh, the other two guides I've brought in are the Let's Go and the Berkeley Guide, which um, are another two collections of guides that are sometimes hard to, uh, to discern uh, any difference between. The Let's Go has been around for several years and is uh, a real favorite with backpackers. It provides the budget information, youth hostels, cheap restaurants, how to get around uh, the cheapest way, where the buses are and so on. Uh, the Berkeley provides the same, although it, it is a little more um, a little more uh, narrative in that it uh, it tends to more towards the politically correct. Uh, it's both these guides are written by student groups. The Let's Go written by Harvard University student groups and the Berkeley by Berkeley University students. Uh, so you can imagine what kind of um, of undertones are coming in through these guides. Uh, they have a lot of attitudes, so you may want to, you know, read a few paragraphs before choosing one of these because it may not really agree with uh, the kind of trip you are planning. Uh, the other, I've also brought in three guides here which fall into the um, cultural guide uh, domain. These guides uh, don't provide any sort of uh, hotel and restaurant information. They do, yes, they do suggest a few, but they tend to be uh, quite high priced and the, the, uh, the information consists only of an address. Uh, they're more um, the kind of guide you would use ahead of time to try and decide where you want to visit. You know you want to go to Greece, but you don't know which island you want to go to. Uh, you know you want to go to London, but you're not really sure how much uh, you want to see in London. So it's a kind of guide to, to, to get you dreaming before you arrive there. They have a lot of photos. So they also make nice souvenirs even uh, after the fact. Uh, the last two guides I brought in uh, oops, are the Michelin Guide. There's the Michelin Red Guide and the Green Guide. Um, many people also often ask, what's the difference between the Michelin and Red and the Michelin Green? Uh, the Red Guide is the practical one with the hotels and restaurants, and the Green is the tourist guide, which, also with, which has the, um, all the description of the sites, the history, the culture, the archae um, architecture, and so on. Uh, no information is doubled within these two guides. They, um, they're, they're not, you have to, if you want one, you have to get the other as well. You won't find what's in one and the other. Uh, 
Prices tend to, uh, to range a little high in the red guide. It's comparable to the Fodor's in terms of uh, price range. As also um, with the green guide, there are no photos. It's very sort of a dry presentation, quick presentation of, uh, of the information. So those are, that sort of rounds up the various big collections of travel guides that are available. Uh, these, along with the ones I spoke about last week, are the, the biggies in uh, travel literature and the ones you should look out for next time you plan your trip. Thank you. And we're back. Joining me now is Lucy Nolet, uh, District Sales Manager, Eastern Canada with Royal Caribbean Cruise Line. Welcome to Travel World. Thank you, Stephen. And now in our opening, I had mentioned that the cruise industry had taken off in the past decade. In general, what numbers are we talking about here? Well, I think if you look at the past five years in Quebec, the growth of the industry has been about 21% every year. And um, I would say if we look at 94, we're looking at about 20,000 people who actually took a cruise, 20,000 Quebecers. So um, I think there's a you know, big potential, and hopefully we'll have more and more people uh, coming with us in the next few years. Right. Now, when we look, say, 20,000 Quebecers, that's still only a very small fragment of the total number of new cruisers in North America as a whole. I think it only represents you know, 10% of the Canadian market. So why, for example, has Quebec lied behind the rest of the country or the rest of the continent, for example? Well, I think maybe different reason. I think uh, maybe one, uh, may, maybe the language issue. And um, probably because if you look a few years back, uh, a lot of cruise lines didn't have any representation in this market. So you've seen a tremendous growth in the past five years, probably mainly because most of the major cruise lines uh, do have a sales manager based in Montreal, which uh, makes a difference, I think. Right. That, that's something that if somebody's in the market trying to promote yeah. it, but people sometimes have an objection to a cruise. They, what are some of those objections? That they're all unfounded, we know, but it's good to bring them out into the open and uh, reflect on them. Well, I think one might be um, there's nothing to do on a cruise. Uh, which, of course, if we look at all the activities, uh, as much as you would like to be busy on a cruise or as much as you just want to be quiet, you can do that. Um, another objection would probably be the age. I think people still have in mind that cruises are for um, the elderly, which, uh, which is not true, because if we look at the average age of our passenger on board a seven-night cruise, we're looking at 42 years old. And um, if you look at a ship like the Majesty of the Seas, which has about 2,500 people, uh, we do target to family cruising. We have one of the best program on board. And uh, honeymooners, family reunions, um, 25th, 50th anniversary, I think now cruising is probably for everybody. Right, it's gone to a broader base yeah. of market, um, even trying to in interest people in taking an incentive sales trip aboard a cruise or holding a meeting on board a cruise. That's right, that's right. Uh, we actually have at Royal Caribbean Cruise Line the largest incentive sales department in the whole industry. And that market represents 10% of our own um, actually uh, volume in sales every year. And uh, we're building ships now with conference meetings and all the equipment required to do um, board meetings, sales meetings, uh, which is a great way of having your people um, enjoying the meeting and enjoying a cruise at the same time. Right, they're all lo in one location. That's right, you don't lose them. <laughs> right, you can't get lost. Another question, people say, oh, they're, they're going to get seasickness. But again, that's not a problem these days. Uh, no, you have to look at all, all the ships do have uh, most of them, of course, do have stabilizer. And um, also when you look at a, a ship like the Majesty, you're looking at like a story of, you know, 14 story high. And of course, the length of the ship would be probably three football fields long. So you're looking at um, a big city on the ocean. And when you sell um, the Caribbean market, I would say most of the time um, the, the sea is calm. But there's little things you can do for seasickness. Um, you know, you, can, you have those little pills that you can take, and the chances are that it's only going to last maybe a, one or two hours if you're affected by it. Right, if yeah. that at all. <laughs> or they'll say they tend to look at the price of a cruise and they say, 
all they do is look at the basic price versus perhaps a land package and they That's think right. the cruise is more and they don't really count in everything that is included. Yeah, you have to keep in mind that 85% um, is already prepaid for. And uh, if you compare it to a land-based vacation, uh, the quality that you get and the satisfaction and the service you're going to get on board is um, probably never going to match um, you know, what a land-based resort would give you. Uh, so you're looking, uh, cruises would start around probably $1,500 Canadian, for depending on the season. Once again, it, it depends of um, the cabin you choose, the accommodations. It could go all the way to 2000 2500 and um, including the air, including all the meals, including all the entertainment on board. The only thing you have to pay would be your drinks. Uh, shore excursions, and um, if you want to gamble a bit on board, well, we don't have really control over right, that. You have one. no control over that. <laughs> yeah. Now, 73% of cruisers in Quebec, I read, take a one-week departure. That seems to be the, the that's figure. Right. Um, and of those, of course, that's going to be a Caribbean destination, and you have both a Western and an Eastern Caribbean right. sailing. What type of, what differentiates those two? Um, routings, what different ports would you see if you went on one or the other? Well, if you choose what we call the Eastern Caribbean, you would uh, visit St. Thomas, you would visit San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, on, like on the Sovereign of the Seas, you would have the chance to uh, call at two of our private islands, which is Labadee and Cocoque. So this is very often what first-timer would consider. Um, a cruise that would give you a few days at sea where you can relax and enjoy the, the ship, which is a destination in itself, and enjoy uh, those ports of call for shopping. And Western Caribbean, you would visit um, you know, Mexico, Jamaica, Grand Cayman, and once again, one of our own private island, Labadee. Right, so, so you get a variety of islands. Again, yeah. that's something people may not originally think. They're so yeah. used to going to one destination, that's but right. you can really get a taste of an island that you may yeah. want to go back to at a later date on a that's, land vacation. That's correct. And what's magic about it is, you know, you have all the nice meals and entertainment and everything that's happening on board, and you go to sleep at night and wake up the next morning in a complete new destination. So um, I think that's the wonderful part of, of cruising. Right, and some people think they go back to the days of the old transatlantic liners, they think small, tiny cabin, but no, the cabins are bigger these days, come with like full hotel amenities. Yeah, that's right. And uh, also we find that you don't spend that much time in your cabin. There's so many different things you can do, so many places, bars you can uh, go to and have a nice drink that um, the cabin is important for some people, but for some other ones, it's, it's um, you know, just a place to go to sleep. <laughs> right, you only have to go there to sleep. You don't right. necessarily have to spend your whole day there. Now, what, for example, would a typical days of activity be? If somebody wanted to be into almost every activity, what could they get involved with? Oh, they could start very early in the morning. We have, of course, all the fitness activities that you can participate uh, and win ship shape dollars for it. Uh, you have all kind of conferences, beauty conference. Um, you can play bingo. You can um, go and get some lectures about the next shore excursions and next ports of calling on a get. And um, you can have some wine tasting. Uh, you can learn how to fold those napkins and, you know, compete with um, our dining room waiters. <laughs> and, um, of course, you have, that's besides uh, all the shows that we have, um, we have at night and just being by the pool, relax. And uh, this is like a day at sea and that's, you know, if you, of course, um, spend a few hours in one port of call, um, you're sure going to fill your days at night um, just going to the shows and um, visiting you can actually go shopping on board. We have free duty shops and uh, you can go and see a movie. We have theaters on board. So it's basically like a little city on its own. Right, it's a yeah. city or a floating That's hotel. Right. You can well, do as yeah. little or as much as you would like to do. Now, also there are other destinations that you go to. It's not just the Caribbean. Somebody's been to the Caribbean, want to go to another cruise experience. You also sail to other parts of the world. That's correct, yeah. We have what we call seasonal cruises. We do go to Bermuda during the summer. We also go to Alaska, which is a beautiful destination. We're doing Panama Canal cruises. We're going to the Mexican Riviera. We also have one ship uh, sailing in Europe. And we have a brand new destination, the Far East, starting this coming December. So um, I think with 
the next few years coming with a lot of new ships, uh, you're going to see more and more destinations uh, with whale Caribbean cruise mm, Right. People on. will have been to one destination, they want to look at something new That's and correct. then they can still keep with the same line and go to another, uh, another area of the world. Of, of those new areas, which seem to date be most popular with Canadians? I would say um, Alaska has been um, getting very popular and the more you talk to people and also people have in mind that um, people going to Alaska would be older, well the average age has been getting younger. We even have the family program on board like youth counselors taking care of kids. And um, I think one of the um, other destinations would probably be the Far East. Um, there's a lot of people from Quebec who already travel to the Far East and um, going on a cruise is a nice way to visit that part of the world. Right, you can basically, you've got your ho floating hotel, you visit a number of destinations and you don't have to worry about all of the land arrangements or getting from point A to point B yeah. once, once you're there. The other thing about an Alaska cruise that is great is it, it's a scenic experience. It is. It's once in a, li in, in a lifetime experience. I think you um, just to see all the the wildlife, the glaciers, just to enjoy the scenery, I think you have to do it once. Yeah. Right, it's something once. Now, if yeah. we look over the next 10 years, where do you see the uh, cruise market uh, going Not in general and for, and for your own company? Well, I think you're going to see a tremendous growth in the next few years. Um, we actually, as a company, has invested one billion dollars, and we are building five new ships, which, has, which are going to be sailing um, between now and 1998. And um, uh, probably you're going to see more and more. Um, I, I think the next three years in the cruise industry are going to be very important, and uh, you're going to see a lot of brand new ships and um, exciting cruises. Right, because I'll be looking for new destinations that each That's company right. will be looking to position themselves more fully. In, in that market, what will happen with the older ships as these new ones come online? Well, there is actually a lot that comes into effect in a couple of years that some of the older ships uh, that don't require, they actually don't meet the, what we call the safety and regulations at sea will have to be um, actually uh, pulled out of the market, which will affect about, I would say, about 20 ships. So that's why you see a lot of new ships coming. New ships then, coming yeah, on. To replace all those. New ships yeah. to experience, new destinations to experience. Mm -hmm. Lucy Nolet of Royal Caribbean Cruise Line, it's certainly been a pleasure. And thank, uh, you. thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure as always. From all of us here, until next time, I'm Stephen Pickford. Happy traveling, everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.